greetings in the wonderful name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. So good to have you here with us this morning, and we trust that as we share and as we meditate and as we just fellowship together, that you will enjoy our time of worship and of fellowship this morning. Can I ask us to just bow our heads before the Lord as we pray and ask God's blessing on all that will happen here this morning. <clears throat> Father, we do thank you this morning for this privilege. Together on this day in the house of the Lord, what a wonderful privilege for us, Lord, just to walk in here and just to know that the Lord is in our midst. Your word is very clear when it says, where two or three of you gather in my name, there I am in the midst. Thank you for being amongst us this morning, Lord. We pray that you will come and visit us again this morning. We thank you that we know, Lord, we can just commit this meeting and this service to you and pray that the Lord's name, in all that will happen here this morning, that name will be glorified. We thank you for each visitor. We thank you for every friend that I've walked in. We thank you, Lord, for our young people, that the young leaders of our Holiday Bible Club. We want to bless you for each one of them, Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And as they share this morning, that we will continue to know and to entrust them to the Lord. For they are embarking, O oh God, on a task this morning, which I believe the Lord has laid on their hearts. Won't you bless them as a group this morning, Lord? And even as they share with us this morning, it will be a real time of blessing and a time of encouragement to them. We thank you, Lord, as we praise and worship you this morning, giving thanks as we pray this in Jesus' name and with thanksgiving. Amen. Now, I want to just welcome you this morning in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thank the Lord that you've seen fit to be with us this morning. May our time of fellowship be really warm in the Lord and may you know God is here and is here to bless us. We have a special group of young people here this morning. We know most of them. I think I know most of them. But we want to thank the Lord for all our holiday. But these are our leaders this morning and we're going to introduce them very shortly. So won't you just clap and give them a nice hand this morning. <laughs> we have spoken much about Sunny Niati. Is Sunny here? I'll have, Sunny, would you please come? Stand here with me. Don't worry, you're not going to talk much now. This is Sunny Niati. The young man. You want to say something? Hello to the children. Okay. Right, so, so he is the young man that's doing his gap here. Uh, this uh, coming here, and he's going to spend three months here at North Pine Baptist, okay? So we want to welcome you this morning, uh, Sunny, and pray that the time that you're going to spend here with us at North Pine will be a blessing, will be such an encouragement to you. And when you leave here in three months' time, you want to say to Uncle Errol, I'm not coming back, I'm staying here. He means that North Pine is by a liquor. Yeah. Yeah. Remember that word, liquor? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as we, and as I speak to him, he's been covered for the first month of July, of course, and so we're still looking for uh, August and September. You want to take two weeks or one week with, uh, in your home to uh, accommodate our young man, please speak to Pastor or to Adrian, and I'm sure that the Lord will bless you as you open your door to this young man. So, Sonny, say hello to the church. Hello, guys. <laughs> Good to be here. Yeah, my name is Sunny Nancy. I'm from Johannesburg and I'm grateful to be able to be part of this church. So great. God is so good. Um, I, I, I thought on Friday night, like, yo, uh, the people at North Pine love children, yo. They love children. Yo, even this morning, I just saw Polonis come in. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Yo, God, God is faithful. God is so good. I saw God's hand at work um, just throughout this month. It is so truly amazing. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has contributed. Thank you to everyone who has sponsored a meal. 
um, whatever the amount, big or small, um, we truly appreciate it because we are um, busy changing the lives of children in this community. Um, Scott's Dean is ready, yes. Wallace Dean is ready, and North Pine is also ready, and Cryfontaine. So we're excited. We're expecting about 150 kids. Um, I want to say thank you for your prayers that has carried us once again, and then continue to pray. I, I'm running on fumes already. So please pray, pray uh, for protection, pray for peace and understanding. Um, but other than that, we are ready. Um, the leaders are ready. They're going to come up, come up, and they're going to introduce themselves one by one, um, where they're from and what they are going to be doing, and just why they want to be in Holiday Club, you know. Um, I just told them, you know, just three things. Oh, it is on. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Keisha, and I will be a section leader of the Grade 6 and 7 and a leader of Grade 7. Thank you. <laughs> morning, church. I'm Alex, and I'm leader for Grade 1. Morning, church. Uh, I am Aidan Thompson, and I am the director. <laughs> morning, church. My name is Shana, and I'm part of Edmund. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I am Aiden, and I'm a leader for the grade fives, and I'm very excited for Holiday Club. Good morning, church. I'm Jade, I'm grade three leader, and I'm very excited. Good morning, church. I'm Caleb, very excited. For When the rain came down, came down Like Moses who followed God And let the slaves in Egypt out Like David who threw a stone And the giant fell down, fell down Like Jonah who ran away But in the belly of the whale turned round I wanna be a hero Music was much louder. I don't know if they're trying to, if they're trying to just be respectful to the fact that the church is getting older. I don't know, but uh, yeah, they're very reserved this morning. My goodness. Anyhow, let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we come, we understand and realize the awesome responsibility and the awesome privilege of being able to share your word and share you with others and even as this group will be doing that to the little ones that will be coming this week i first of all want to pray for these little ones i pray that you would keep them safe and that as they come and as they uh, spend time here dear god that your hand will be upon each and every single one of them and father whatever hindrances they are at the moment just keeping them from coming to holiday bible club that you would remove those hindrances in the mighty name of jesus christ and i pray lord that uh, your hand will be upon each and, and that you'd prepare their hearts prepare their souls just for what you have in store for them this week but then i pray for these people dear god these leaders and those that will be working actively in the holiday club. Lord, their responsibility is no less than any responsibility that we have. Standing in the pulpit, sharing the word of God. And Lord, as they will be sharing your word. As they will be sharing you with the children. I pray that you would place within their hearts the responsibility that they have. To do just that. To 
speak and preach the word of God in their way to these little ones. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep their hearts safe, that you would keep their hearts uh, uh, prepared for that. And that, Father, every single personal uh, hindrance there might be that you would remove those, dear God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that they will know that they have a task and that they will know that that task being a task that the Lord has given them will be a task that supersedes every personal hindrance that there may be. And I pray, Lord, that you'd undertake for them and that you'd touch them. I pray, Lord, your unction upon them, your anointing upon them. Uh, Pastor Adrian and Marissa, as they, dear God, uh, just keep everything together and they are the ones having to put the energy into getting this group going. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon each and every one of them, that you would touch them, that you would keep them, and that at the end of it, they will walk away knowing that God was able to use them to the full in Jesus' mighty name. Undertake for them, dear God. Keep them. And Lord, I pray that every single need that they may have will be fulfilled, will be seen in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. No one I would have put my t-shirt on too this morning. But yeah, great excitement and I trust that we will just continue to pray as Pastor prayed for our young people as they with great excitement look forward to this coming week. I want to just share with you from the word of the Lord this morning, friends. And uh, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to, I will have actually asked Marissa to read the scripture for me. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 1. Marissa, if you could come and just do that scripture reading for us, please. Matthias 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 from verses 1 through 16. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give, gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. May God bless the reading Thank of you so word. much. Thank you so much, uh, Marissa, for sharing the word, reading God's word with us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you this morning, our God and our King, in Jesus' name. Amen. A very, very well-known portion of Scripture to everyone this morning. I'm sure you've heard and you've read the attitude, the Beatitudes in the book of Matthew, and it's also in Luke, and I think in one of the other Gospels. Now, this account here, where Jesus now goes to the mountainside, happened just after his early ministry started. It's very early in his, in his ministry. And you'll notice if you read the previous chapters, it deals with his return to Nazareth, 
There's an issue on John the Baptist preparing the way. There's the baptism of Jesus. And then Jesus begins preaching. And then, of course, the call of his disciples. So it's very early in the ministry of Jesus, okay, when, when, when this account happens. What is very, very interesting for me as I read this passage of Scripture, uh, friends, is that when you look at the crowds following Jesus, you will notice one thing. <coughs> it, it wasn't so much about them wanting to change their lives. It wasn't about much about them wanting to turn their lives around and to, to, to live differently. <coughs> Excuse me. When you read the passage, when you read the previous passages, you will notice they followed Jesus because of the miracles that he performed. The Bible says, that if you read the f f previous uh, chapters, that he healed the sick, he drove demons out, he raised up, he raised up the dead, and he was healing the sick people all around him. Well, there was a lot of sickness in the area. Now, this intrigued the people. And they said to themselves, but we haven't seen this before. We haven't noticed this before. We have people that make money here. We have people that do all sorts of things here. But this man heals the sick. This man makes the blind to see. This man makes, raises the dead. There must be specials. Spe something special about this man called Jesus. And the Bible says, now because of that, they followed him wherever he went. Because they were intrigued by the miracles that Jesus performed. And so when Jesus then saw that the crowds were really, really increasing... And it was tiring him out. The Bible says he retreated to the mountainside. He wanted to get away from this people. Just to give himself at some time to find himself again because it was extremely tiring. The very interesting thing is this for me. That when he retreated to the mountainside, the crowds from all over noticed that he left them. So what did they do? They followed him. They followed him in their hundreds. Followed him up the mountainside. Because they wanted to be with this man that performed miracles. Jesus' message earlier on was this repent for the kingdom of God is near repent for the kingdom of God is near so his message was about repentance and about the kingdom of God that was going to be established they were not interested about repenting and about the kingdom of God all they wanted to see was miracles all they wanted to see was the blind be see again. All they wanted to see was the, the lame way to walk again, the, the raising the dead, and all those things. They were intrigued by the miracles that this Jesus performed. And so when Jesus moves away from them to the side of the mountain, they followed. We have the Sermon on the Mount there. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. But there's something very interesting, I think, that we miss sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. You see, the Bible says when Jesus was there on that mountainside and the crowds were there, there's something very interesting that happens here. The Bible says, in verse, if I can just call it quickly, in verse 1. His disciples came to him. Sorry, verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, listen to this, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. Now listen to this. His disciples came to him 
And he began to teach who? The disciples. He began to teach them. The crowd is there. The crowd is there. But the Bible says Jesus began to teach them, the disciples. If you read the same account of the same narrative in the book of Luke, I think it's chapter 6, verse 20, it says, the crowds gathered, and the Bible says, and Jesus looking at the disciples. Get this in your mind. There's the crowds around him. He calls his disciples, his followers, and the Bible says in Luke 6, 20, he looked at the disciples. He was going to address the disciples. The crowd would hear some of the messages or the sermon that he would share, but he was primarily, his primary audience was his followers. He was going to teach them how to teach the crowd. How to teach those that came to see the miracles, to see the healing of, of the sick and the raising of the dead. He was going to use and instruct his disciples to teach them, to show them how the kingdom of God works. And he starts off by saying, and he began to teach the disciples, and he gives the eight beatitudes, there's eight of them, the blessings that is bestowed upon those that would follow his directive. So when we, when we say all of this, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something very clearly here. When Jesus came to the earth, it was primarily to set up his kingdom. But not the kingdom that the people were used to. Not that kingdom. Remember they were under Roman government. Okay? They were ruled by the Romans. And their thinking was as Jews, when this Jesus comes, he's going to change all of them. He's going to get a new government in. He's going to get the new rulers in. And, and everything is going to change. Not understanding that the kingdom that Jesus was going to establish was not an earthly kingdom. It was not going to be a king sitting on a throne in a palace and all those kind of things. It was going to be a spiritual kingdom. A spiritual kingdom containing people that have decided to turn their lives around, to be born again, to, to follow Jesus, and then spiritually be ushered into this kingdom that was going to be established on earth. So with this in mind, these followers that came on the mountainside, remember friends, they have not made a commitment, many of them, had not made a commitment to follow Jesus yet. It was all about curiosity. It was all about uh, being there to see the miracles. So they have not been ushered into this kingdom that Jesus came to establish, the spiritual kingdom where everybody being born again will be ushered into this kingdom. And so Jesus, knowing this, wanted to bring a we are point, made up, make a point very clear to the disciples to say to them, I am keen for this people. I am, I, I, my heart goes out to this people because I see, I can see that they are rudderless. There's almost no direction in their lives. But guess what, disciples? I'm going to teach you to teach them how my kingdom works. How they can get into my kingdom. Out of the kingdom of slavery, out of the kingdom that they are living in now, and to come into my kingdom. So this is what I want to do. I want to talk to you about this kingdom. So what does he do? 
He first of all, in the first 12 verses, the first 12 verses, friends, Jesus talks to his disciples, firstly, about the character of kingdom life. In other words, how you live, how you behave in this kingdom. So if you look at the first 12 verses, those beatitudes, they are basically the character traits of people that have come to Jesus and they now live in his kingdom. All those things that you see, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger, for they will be filled. Blessed are in other words, those characteristics will be the experience of everybody that comes into God's kingdom, that comes to live in that kingdom. In other words, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be time that you're going to be more, be a mourn. There are times that you're going to be ridiculed. There are times that you're going to be, uh, you'll have to be a peacemaker and all of those things that you read in the Beatitudes. Friends, those are the directive of Jesus to his disciples. In other words, tell them that when you come into my spiritual kingdom, you may experience all of these things. So some of them are hearing this because some of them are in earshot of what Jesus is telling his disciples. And he gives them those eight, I think it's about eight uh, beatitudes in that passage. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Uh, blessed are people, uh, you when people insult you. And all of that and all of that. That is the character of kingdom life. The character of kingdom life. But here's the key. Here's the key. Here's the key. In order for you to come into that kingdom, you need to repent first. Because Jesus says, repent for the kingdom is about to be established. When he says the kingdom is near, it is about to be established. So in order for you to get into my kingdom, you need to leave the old life. Repentance, I think we heard it during the week of prayer. Repentance means just to turn around, to leave the old life and enter into my kingdom that I am coming to establish, which is a spiritual kingdom. That's the qualification. Repentance, then into my kingdom. Receiving me as Savior, then into my kingdom. And I looked at that passage and I realized again that God has given and gives us so many opportunities to enter His kingdom. Praise the Lord for every person that sits here this morning that have already done that. You can think of a day when you bowed your knees and you bowed your head in the presence of God and you said, Lord, I am a sinner. Save me, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Forgive my sins, Lord. I repent of my past. I want to turn my life around and I want to follow you. Isn't it wonderful to have that testimony this morning in this church? That you look back and say, man, that is my old life. That is what you guys remember of me. I'm done with that hutus. I'm finished with that stuff. I'm a new person now. I follow Jesus. I have repented and I have come into his spiritual kingdom where Jesus is Lord, where Jesus is King, and he controls that kingdom. So I've come out of darkness and I've come into the marvelous light, which is the kingdom that Jesus speaks about right here in the outset of his ministry. So the character of kingdom life, friends, are all those things that you will read in the first 12 verses. When you read it again, and you say to yourself, my goodness, that is what I have experienced. My goodness, I have experienced ridicule. 
Man, I have experienced uh, 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 all those things that is mentioned here. I had time of mourning. There were times I was sad, and it has been my experience. Friends, I want to say to you this morning, don't be surprised. Why? That is the character of kingdom life. It's who we are. We are not exempt from all those things that Jesus speaks about. We will be mourning at some stage, friends. We will be ridiculed at some times. Sometimes you've got to go and be a peacemaker. Isn't it? A peacemaker. Where you go into a situation as a Christian, as someone from the kingdom, and you go and make peace. And so Jesus mentions all that beatitudes, which is the character of kingdom life. But now I want to bring you to a very important part of that. You see, when you look at the crowd standing there, wondering what is going on here, Jesus is giving his disciples, remember, he's addressing his disciples. He gives them two very important instructions, and he says to them, secondly, this is my second point quickly, the character of kingdom life, verse 1 to 12. And then secondly, what every inhabitant of the kingdom must be. He says, that is your character, that is what you will experience, that is what you will go through in life, in general, in my kingdom. But I want to let you know, and I want to inform you, there are two things that you must be. And that, friends, is verse 13 and verse 14. You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. What is the implication here? He's saying to them, in order for you to be effective in getting my gospel message about the kingdom to people out there, to this crowd standing here, to this holiday club kids, kids coming this coming week, what's the key? To touch them, to move them, to encourage the kids, these kids to follow Jesus. You've got to be two things. You've got to be salt, and you've got to be light. That's all. You've got to be salt of the earth, and you've got to be light to them. You see, if you want to move people get to get closer to the Lord, to come to that point where they are virtually into the kingdom of God, there is something that I, as a follower of Jesus, must do, must be. And the one is salt, and the one is light. Now, it is, it is quite interesting. Why did Jesus use salt and light? Why didn't he use something else? Why didn't he say sugar? You must be sugar or pepper or something. I said the other day, why the salt of the earth? And why light? You see, God has called us to be salt and He's called us to be light. Now, I looked this up and I was wondering why did Jesus use salt as an imperative for people to move others? You see, I don't become salt or light for myself. I become that for other people. For other people. Now, it's very interesting if you read up on this old salt story in those early biblical days. It says, and I think some of the basic principles still apply today. Salt is associated or was associated with purity. It keeps everything clean. 
Now the Romans was a race. The Romans were people. Everything had to be pure. Everything must be clean. Everything must be, must be uh, spotless. And so for virtually everything, the Romans used salt. Allah gooi salt oorals. They just salt everything because salt was a sign to them of purity. And so even when, 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 you, uh, when Jesus says something about uh, if it's gone bad, if the, sun is, if the salt has gone bad, it is no good to be used anymore. You can throw it away and men can trample upon it. You see, in the old temple worship, the priests would come into the temple as part of the sacrifice and they would take salt. They were so afraid that the sacrifice on the altar will go off that they put salt on the sacrifice just in case it goes off so that it can stay pure. So the salt was sprinkled on the altar, on the sacrifice, before they left. So Jesus says, if the salt has gone bad, right, it is no longer use for us. So what we then do, says the Bible, Men throw it away and it is trampled underfoot. Because in the temple, if salt has gone off and they discover that the salt is off, they would take that salt, the old salt, they will go outside the temple, on the steps of the temple, they will sprinkle the old salt that is useless inside. And so people, when they come into the temple for worship, they would wipe their feet on the salt so that they don't slip around, okay? And from there, they would walk into the temple. Hence Jesus' words. It is no, use to, no good to be used. It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The idea coming from when they sprinkle the old salt onto the steps of the temple. And so when people, they do that. So that is the value of salt that has gone off. Hence Jesus' implication is, salt speaks of purity. Salt speaks of purity. A life that has a, that has a desire to be pure before the Lord. And I know that is an area that so many of us and all of us fail in terms of our purity before the Lord. But friends, because Jesus uses the example of salt, the idea is that we, our lives need to be so pure. There need to be a strive for purity. We will probably not make it, but there needs to be a strive for that so that my life will be able to help others. You see, the salt on the altar, on the sacrifice, help that me to stay fresh and to stay pure. So when the priest would come and light it, it, was, it gave him a pure aroma with that salt going up into the ceiling of the temple. That's why Jesus uses salt that needs to be part of our character. But not only friends was salt uh, known for its purity, but it was most common of all preservatives in those days. It was the best preservative for all those days. And so when the people never had fridges like we have, the ice, what is the Heisen's fridge, and, the, and, and what's the other fridge, what do you mean, friend? Say it again. Felicia, what's that old one that we still have? Is a, anyway, uh, but, but there was no fridges. So when they would preserve meat, they would stack it up. They would stack it up, and guess what? They would take salt, and they would throw and sprinkle it over the meat that is kept somewhere in the store. So exactly what the fridge did, the salt, for them. It kept that meat to a certain degree preserved. Preserved. So the next day or the two or three days later, when they come to cut meat, it wasn't smelly or rotty or frotter. Or, or rotty or frotty. <laughs> That's a new word. 
but they could take it because that two, three days while the salt was on the meat, it was preserved. It was fine. While the salt was there, things were preserved. While the salt was there, the meat was fine. While the salt was there, the meat was still edible. Because salt in those days was a preservative. And I know today we still use salt as a preservative. But friends, basically in the day, because you see, Jesus speaks in the context of where they are now or then. He understands the context why he says they must be salt. Because he knows that salt is a preservative. And as salt preserves meat, so those who live in the kingdom, so those who are followers of Jesus, needs to be people that can preserve and help others to stay fresh. You will have boys and girls walking here in this coming week, coming from different homes, coming from different challenges. There may be kids coming into this church this coming days that comes from a broken family, that comes from a situation in mom and dad is split up, or it's a broken home. It's a child that's not doing well at school. They will probably not speak about these two things to you. But can I ask you guys, not only you, but everybody, make sure that you are ready as a salt preservative to help these boys and girls to settle down at least for the week. And you be salt to them. You preserve them. You speak to them as someone that has empathy with them, that understands them. There will be younger ones, there will be older ones, but guess what? God has called you and all of us to be preservatives of the lives of other people, or to other people, wrong. There are broken people in this world today, friends. There are broken people sitting right next to you in the bus or in the taxi. There are broken people living next door to you. There are people wherever we go, they are just not what they want to be. And guess what? The Lord has called you to be sold to them. The Lord wants you to be a preservative to them. And help them through their struggles. So that at least they know, these people have given me hope. They've given me help to go through my challenges. And so we find then that salt is secondly then a preservative. But very quickly, salt also adds flavor to the food. Flavor to the food. Now I know there are people that love salt. As men say about salt, of be papklatsit, and salt of jungleot, and salt of everything gets salt. Sometimes they oversalt the thing, but they have no problem with that. Rather too much than too little. But friends, have you ever tasted something that has no salt? Something that is bland. Hello, Framas, we believe for some chips. So to not say, yeah, money, hoi, ma, hoi, ma, is so to hoi, 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 hoi. Because salt adds flavor to what you're eating, salt adds flavor to the food. Salt adds flavor to the soup. Salt adds flavor to any meal that you have. It just makes that difference. Guess what? Jesus uses the example of salt because Jesus wants his people in his kingdom to be people that has flavor. He wants you to bring to a bland life, a life that has no meaning, a life that Thing. He wants the kingdom people, he wants his disciples to go to them and add some flavor to their lives. Give people a reason to live. You know what, friends? People are waiting for us to give them hope today. We're living in a society that has lost a lot of hope. But praise God, God wants the child of the Lord, God wants the believer, God wants you and I.
to bring some flavor to someone's life. Just to change them. Won't it be nice if a kid walks in here in this week and he comes in here with a long face and he's sad because of his domestic situation and you as a worker, you as an adult, can sit down with this youngster and just talk to him. You know what you're doing? You're bringing some flavor to his or her life. Or her life. And you're changing their situation. Won't it be good at the end of the week when they come back and say to you, you know what? Things have just changed at home. You know what? God has used you to speak to me. God has used you to bring some flavor to my life. And I'm so thankful to the Lord for that. Friends, there's reason why Jesus wants us to be salt. To change things around. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And it's not speaking about the earth, the sand and the stone. He says, no, the people that dwell on the earth, you are salt and light to them. You are salt to them. Friends, can I say to you, be salt. Be a preservative. Bring meaning to the lives of others. Jesus instructs his disciples. You see this crowd here? They need you to bring meaning to their lives. Make a difference. Be a preservative to them. Bring some flavor to, them, to, to, to their lives. Add them to my kingdom. <coughs> Be salt to them. He uses another beautiful example. He says not only salt. What does he say? But be light. Be light to them. I think we read it there in verse 14. He says to the disciples, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. You see, friends, light does not speak. Light shines. Light does not speak. If I bring a torch here, or we, if I come into a, into a dark room, okay, and I've got light, of course, when there's no load shedding, uh, then put the light on, and the light would shine in the darkness. But the light don't speak. The light just shines. The light lights up a room. And he hasn't announced his presence by word of mouth. Light just shines. It's like a lighthouse. A lighthouse doesn't shine from the lighthouse on top of the light into the boats. Be careful, there are rocks here. No. The light, Sister Elise, Soviet, the light just shines. And so the captain of the boat will see in the distance, there is a lighthouse. We must steer away from that danger. It does not speak. It just shines. And Jesus says to them, to them you are the light of the world. And lights also do not hide. Lights do not hide their lives. They operate in the open. The light does not hide itself. Where, does, where is light more effective? When it's, when it's dark. It's pointless me coming now and taking a torch with this light here and trying to shine it will make no difference. But light shines when there's or where there's darkness. Light shines where there is darkness. And I want to ask you this morning and remind us, friends, as I just draw to a close with this message to you this morning. Light is what God wants you and you and you and me to shine in this very dark world. There's lots of darkness out there. But Jesus says to his disciples, 
you are the light of the world. In other words, when you as a Christian, when you as a holiday club worker walks into a situation where there's darkness, where you can sense from this child's mouth or from this child's situation, there's darkness at home. The Lord wants you to come with your light that God has shone in your heart and bring some light into his situation. And all you want to do is from your own personal experience, share how God lit up your life. And say to them, I was also there once upon a time. I was also there once upon a time. But I'm glad to tell you this morning that God has shone his light into my heart and I can shine it onto you right now. Be the light to people. You see, light speaks of our outward lives. Salt speaks of our inward lives. So with light, we protect others. And with salt, we preserve ourselves. Friends, brothers and sisters, Jesus loves people. But Jesus wants them to come to understand and to know that to get into my kingdom, you need to play according to my rules. We've got rules in the kingdom. We've got rules in this kingdom. And it starts with repentance. And then you move into my kingdom. And so Jesus sits with his disciples. And he teaches them. And he's saying to them, that crowd standing on the mountainside, that crowd following me, they are waiting for you to go and be salt and to go and be light to them. And I want to say to us as a church, there's a community wherever you are, at work, in your community where you live, where, wherever you are, there are people waiting for you to come and be salt and to come and be light to them. And that the Lord will use your lives to change things around, to make things different. And so we find, friends, that Jesus speaks to them because he loves that people. He wants to make them understand it's not about the miracles. We've got lots of that today, friends. People say, come to a miracle this and come to a miracle that and come to a miracle that. As if they can perform the miracles. It's not about that, friends. It's about presenting Jesus and it's a presenting myself as salt and as light. And because of that, God can change the situation. Not because I'm there, but because I present salt and I present light to people. I can turn things around because of my life that are hid in Jesus Christ, who shines his light through my life. Friends, young people, you are the salt of the earth. Remember that. You are the light of the world. Make a difference this week in the life of some young child. Let them come to you at the end of the week and say to you, Maddie, whoever, Madeline, thank you for what you've done for me during this week. You may not know what you guys, but you said something to me that's helped me. Be salt and be light to our children in this coming week. Folk out there, be light and be salt to someone in this coming days. Change someone's perspective. Change someone's life. Change their situation by you being what God wants you to be salt and light. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning. You love us so much. We can never really un fully understand the scope of your love for each one of us. But we thank you this morning that you have set some time aside for us to remind us that in order for us, Lord, to help others, we need ourselves to be salt. 
we need to be light. We need to be the influence of positivity in the lives of other people. I pray this morning, dear God, that your blessing will rest upon each one of us. Not only our young holiday club leaders, but also everybody else in our church here this morning. That we will go from here and we will be those catalysts that will turn and change things around in people's situations. I pray your blessing upon every congregant this morning. And may your wonderful peace continue to abide with us. As we bless you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. like a knife The world just doesn't need another hero today Who'll tell them what they know they shouldn't do They need to hear that somebody loves them And it's up to me and you 